Hello and welcome to the first video in our Veteran Cinema Podcast, where we're going to be looking over movies about veterans this month, and about essentially soldiers suffering from PTSD. That's essentially, that's generally the idea. Mostly we're going to be trying to follow the line of uh, movies and some dramas from the First World War, that showcased the First World War, through to the Second and onwards, as well as occasionally pausing for fa mostly fantasy authors as well who survived this period. Um, there's the Cold War. We also want to watch some Cold War movies. Um, but we're going to start with a movie that's not actually connected to any of these. Not directly, at least. The Last Samurai. Honestly, this movie is one of my favorites. I first saw it in 2005, two years after it came out. When our dad uh, decided to, he wanted me to try watching it, uh, and I did, and I got choked up. Oh first yeah! First time I saw it, this movie, like we just finished watching it, and I'm kind of choked up. It's like there are several points in the movie that you can't help but feel choked up. Look, now the movie follows Nathan Algren, played by the excellent Tom Cruise. Sorry, dude's a freaking masterclass actor. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing is this. Uh, portrayal of PTSD is one of the most vivid and terrifying in some ways. As Nathan Algren is a guy who works for the Winchester Guns Company, and he may basically tries to help them sell guns by saying, yes, this is all that stood between me and the savages. But what he doesn't reveal is that he spent time with the native tr some of the native tribes, and he may have fallen in love, he may have lived with them, but that he helped in the Indian Wars, cut them down, and that he's not proud of what he's done. And he kind of regrets it and questions whether the U.S. had the right to the uh, Western hinterlands that they now do control. And, you know, he, he kind of just doesn't like what his country has become or what, or, uh, you know, what he's done. As Algren's also, also implied to have fought in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. At least I always thought he did. So you have to bear in mind, the movie takes place in 1867. This would be two years after his last tour during the Civil War. So America's just come out of the Indian War and the Civil Wars, or at least some of the Indian Wars. And the response from Algren is one of just disillusionment. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as he puts it later, this is the only work for which he's suited to his mind. As he's recruited uh, by his former uh, lieutenant that he worked with, uh, Gant, an Irish-American soldier, into joining up with Bagley, his former commander, and going over to recruit, uh, well, to recruit and train Japanese soldiers or draftees to kill the samurai, uh, the renowned warriors of Japanese history that I did my bachelor's in. Because, honestly, they are the most awesome and interesting uh, warrior society that's ever lived on Earth. That's not me saying that because I love them so much. That's a fact. They're also the most civilized in history. Now, I do know that they had their dark side. But I'm just saying, overall, they were the most cultivated and civilized. And the most terrifying in some ways. Just with the stuff they, were, they allowed themselves to do at times. But the thing is, Algren is also a drunk as he like at the recruitment dinner he's completely hammered he already he, and rude he self-medicated his ptsd with alcohol yes which you know that's not that doesn't go well that never goes well and what i like is a scene where they're on the boat and where he just you know like he's like i have been hired to suppress another tribal leader apparently this is the only work for which i am suited and it's you can get choked up in that scene. And then he, no, he's donning his uniform with trembling hands and remembering back the native, he's thinking back to the natives he slaughtered and he helped slaughter. And, well, I know that sounds weird, but he didn't want to slaughter. That's what I meant to say. Now, he looks himself in the mirror and turns his, averts his gaze. So that, as you pointed out, dude can't, must hate mirrors because he can't even meet, look himself in the eye anymore and i love how you put that because that is what you you see here mm -hmm. he is a 
I would argue, broken individual. He's a broken man. There, like Algren, when you see him in the flashbacks, he is whole. But you see that the dawning horror as he's forced to slaughter the natives he spent time with. But here you see the after effect where he's just there's nothing left. He's broken. He's shattered. Mm -hmm. And does he like he craves death? So he arrives on the Japanese uh, shore, uh, well, of Honshu, and ends up, well, uh, meeting up with uh, Simon Graham, who's to be his translator. Uh, now, there are some humorous scenes initially with uh, Simon Graham, as well as with Gant, such as, I will uh, kick every Far Eastern buttocks that appears before me if you're not in line. All the Japanese men immediately hurry into line. We have Algren dryly. Nicely done, Gant. It helps when you understand the language. When you understand the language, everything else falls into place. Meaning, just screaming at people is, that's, you know, like, that crosses all borders when you're in a military uniform. I, I love Gant in this movie. Yeah. But when he dies, it's a, it's a shocking and jarring scene. You feel the grief. You do feel grief stricken for his death. But on the other hand, I love, like, right before he died, he, he lived and died an Irishman in some ways. It's like, uh, uh, Lieutenant Grant, you will report to the rear. Lieutenant Grant, did you hear my order from Algren? You have him. Yes, I did indeed, sir. Can you obey it? With all due respect, sir, shove it up your ass. Just like an Irishman. But at the same time, there's a bit of a sideline from Gant when he first recruits Algren, where he says, uh, uh, you know, I've got some work for you. And you have Algren who says, uh, what kind of work? The only work for which you're suited, boyo. A man's work. Now, it's not that Gant's toxic, but it's just, there's a, you know, you as the audience feel a sorrow in there for Algren, because you know this kind of work isn't something he should be doing in his mental condition. It's just going to further damage him. Mm -hmm. But he allows himself to be talked into it, because he's been fired by Winchester, and he doesn't know any other line of work, and he can't go back to the farm, so, he, that he mentions later in the movie as having come from, so he's... He's got nothing left. But that said, he fights like a tiger, because just to reference Katsumoto's one dream. And Katsumoto, is so, who's the other main character of the movie, is so amazed by this and the resemblance to his dream that when Katsumoto, well, when Algren kills uh, Katsumoto's brother in law, uh, Hirotaro, he just kind of decides to take Algren prisoner, thinking it is sign, though he's not sure of what. And so Algren is taken back to uh, Katsumoto's son's town, this, the town that he owns, to be cared for by uh, Hirotaro's uh, widow, Taka. And from there, the Arthurian myth of the Red Warrior is essentially played out. I'm just saying. Uh, where the warrior recovers in the house of a lady, falls in love with her, and soon dons her husband's armor and, you know, and becomes the new husband. Now, this is a... now. But in turn, juxtaposed with, instead of uh, Arthur, we have Katsumoto. The imagery is very, very evident there. And Katsumoto uh, starts to read uh, Algren's old uh, journal, war, Indian War journals and learning about the Indian War, the American Civil War, and is just generally kind of like, oh, okay. So he's starting to understand American history and the mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, he initially did want to kind of understand his enemy, but... Uh, as Algren lives on in the village there, him and Katsumoto start to develop a bit of a bromance as they find that they're not terribly dissimilar in certain key ways. Uh, Katsumoto also gets beaten down by my favorite character in the movie, played by probably my favorite Japanese actor ever, uh, Hiroyuki Sanada. This is the movie that made me really, like, become a geek of his. But then it was his next couple of movies that I saw that I kind of really grew to adore the man. The man is a god amongst actors. He's a sonata. Yeah. Uh, he has the sonata spirit, to quote uh, somewhere where he's doing. Oh, man. But Hiroyuki Sanada's character, Ujio, is probably one of the most badass characters in the movie who tolerates no disrespect. And I wish that they stuck the deleted scene with him slicing off a merchant's head for showing him disrespect at the beginning of the movie. Because that just... Like, that's so Ujio, right? Yeah. He's just like, no one... This respects me. I'll chop off their heads no matter what. But Ujio 
in turn, does not understand Oliver and thinks he should kill himself. And Katsumoto immediately says, no, that's not really their way. And you have a, I don't know why I decided to spare him, but we're going to keep him alive for a while. You have Ujio, who scoffs at this. But Ujio, though he beats down Algren in the rain in one dramatic, great scene, even he's starting to be shocked. He was awed and shocked. Like, just that, how Algren wouldn't stay down. But on the other hand, he had a certain amount of respect for the man that grew there. And later, a few scenes later, Algren decides that he wants to become, he wants to learn the, the ways of Katana, of Iaido, or Katana. Um, the way of the bush, of the bushi, or Bushido. And having learned a bit of Iaido myself, honestly, it's easy to fall in love with. Uh, I'm not terribly good. It's been years. I'd love to get back into it. If I could just find a good Iaido instructor to teach me and guide me um, mm -hmm. uh, anywhere near the area where I live. So either that or I have to hijack back to Japan and study up there again. Oh, man. But the, the thing with uh, Algren is... At first, yeah, he as you noted, he was trying to use a katana like a saber, he did, mm -hmm. or at least a boken, and he didn't understand it. It's after studying under Ujio for a good chunk of the movie that he starts to grasp, you know, the ideas behind it mm -hmm. and, and ingrain it in your muscle memory. Now, there are people who say you can't really learn Japanese swordsmanship that fast. Uh, actually, you kind of could. It's not that... Like, if you have a good enough instructor, I did... And I learned quite a bit, not a great deal, but I learned quite a bit. And in one year, I've seen, I saw people go from like almost like not knowing how to hold it to basically wielding it like it's an extension of themselves. So it is certainly, Al, what Alpern does in this movie is humanly possible. Mm -hmm. It's very realistic, actually. And that's the funny thing. People kept saying back in the day that was not realistic. Actually, it is. But you have to you have to know a thing or two about the katana to be able to go, yeah, that's actually possible. And after spending some time in the village, Katsumoto uh, takes Algren back. Now, Algren by now has basically become a father to Hirotaro's uh, sons, uh, become a bestie to Katsumoto, mm -hmm. uh, whom I got the feeling didn't never fully connected with his actual brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. He essentially became. A part of the village. It's like, yeah, and uh, it's and Taka has begun to start to fall in love with him, mm -hmm, uh, was, and he with her. But he's also begun to learn the language, and you see as the movie progresses that he starts to speak less and less English. He starts to wear less and less Western clothes, and starts to prefer being more Eastern. And honestly, it's understandable because on it's as Omura. Uh, the villain says in the movie, because uh, uh, he ends up saying, like, the ways of the samurai is very seductive. And Algren says, but they're, you know, like, I fought many tribal leaders. Katsumoto's no different. Uh, yes, but you fought many, uh, you fought many tribal leaders, but none who were samurai. Their ways have a great deal of appeal. And Omura's not an idiot. He's speaking from personal experience. He hates the samurai. But he kind of gets the appeal on some level. He disdains it, but he gets it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, although. Now, the Emperor, meanwhile, is ballless. Um, my apologies to my Japanese friends for disrespecting your monarch, one of your pre previous one of the previous monarchs and one of your favorites. But in this movie, he's a little ballless in a few scenes. But then uh, when he uh, destroys Omura in that one scene with a couple of words and just shoving the katana in his face. Dude is badass. It's a great scene. He needed a tragedy in order to wake up. Yes. And the f too often sometimes that's the way of life. And the thing is, throughout the movie, Algren's trying to reclaim and rediscover his honor. And in the West, uh, the, pr the sad thing is we've been bred to disdain honor and chivalry for years, decades, maybe even a century, when in reality, this is probably the best part of masculinity. Mm -hmm. The ability to show respect and dignity to other fellow human beings and treat others like we'd like to be treated. Mm -hmm. And to... And, like, the idea of chivalry is also to uphold your lady 
and above all others and to swear yourself to an ideal or to a certain person you you uh, respect and have a platonic love for and all but be willing to die for them. And the sad thing is, now we have Kingdom of Heaven, that was a great movie that came out about the same time as Last Samurai. Then the director's cut came out 10 years later. That does a good job here. But at the same time, in novels, we have not seen in a long time this kind of warrior spirit. Now, the warrior archetype is what Algren's all about. Mm -hmm. And he's, in a way, a fallen knight who ends up becoming a samurai. Now, it'd be very interesting to see maybe a fallen samurai one day become a knight in a movie or something. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, but, it's like I'd see that. Uh, yeah, I'd watch that. Uh, it would make very little sense to a limited extent, but eh, screw it. I love... I just... Like, that's the thing. I love the uh, warrior archetype in myths mm. and movies. And the thing is, Al Grant... Now, here's the thing. Edward Zwick uh, and, and Tom Cruise with this movie wanted to kind of, I think, not just uh, pay homage to the warrior spirit of Japan, but also show it to, uh, to the West and say, guys, ladies, wake up. Look at what's beautiful here. Like, We've been shunning the warrior spirit, the uh, code of chivalry of and Bushido in the West for too long. We've forgotten our traditions. We need, to, people, we need some of them. People back. have twisted it just to mean what they want to say and use it to denigrate the masculine spirit when and manipulate the masculine spirit to their own whim. When in reality, there's a beauty to it. There's a beauty to... Uh, to that male warrior in a way. And like you look at even in a lot of fiction and even actual blacksmiths. Like I actually got to talk to a swordsmanship shop uh, keep uh, who did do some blacksmithing on it as well uh, when I was in Japan. And I asked him like, why do you forge swords? And he gave the same answer that they give in uh, manga and whatnot. And it, you there are documentaries about the forging of katanas, and you have the actual blacksmiths in real life who say the same thing because I think they're beautiful, especially when they're swung with reverence and love in their hearts. Now, this guy actually said, I could tell uh, your friends and you because there were like three British Brits and I, as well as our one Japanese uh, senpai from the uh, mm -hmm. who was the uh, club president. I like, I know her, I know you, I can tell from the way you guys are just geeking out over the swords and just ooing and on, just unsheathing it a little and just like wanting to just touch it and just go, this is so beautiful and magnificent. I could tell from, I, I don't understand your language, but he said like, and, and our senpai translated for some of us who didn't understand it, basically me, <laughs> but most of them under, most of our group did understand him. And he said, I could tell you guys really do love this and you have a great deal of respect. I want to see people like you swing the sword. I, that's like, I just want people like you to swing it and be and draw that happiness, and he said, like when you're swinging the sword, it's like you're praying, like you're you're just you empty your mind and you're just calm at peace. And he's like, I know that because I've swung it, and I just want people to experience that. That's the only reason I forged this, and that's really the spirit of this movie. It is a beautiful spirit. Mm -hmm. Now that said, the PTSD Algren showcases is a very real thing. And we're not gonna... Like, we have to lean in there. The thing is, we just... We're in awe at the fact that this movie is so archetypal. Mm -hmm. But... And at the beauty that it has of the friendships. Like, you look at Katsumoto, Ujio, and Algren. The three of them have one of the most awesome bromance. And you also have Nobutada and Algren who have a great bromance. Mm -hmm. Hell, the scene where Katsumoto... Any scene with Katsumoto and Nobutada, you can see the father-son love. It's basically Simba and Mufasa. But the sad thing is here in this movie, Mufasa buries Simba. And remember, like that scene, you were getting choked up. Like, yeah. Where he's just like touching his son's cheek and you've got Watanabe Kenny nails it. And it's just like, he looks like he's bawling like a baby mm -hmm. and before he runs. Yeah. But the thing is, the PTSD Katsumoto showcases in the next few scenes, he's a lot more subdued and you can see that he's shaken and that part of him is a little broken by the death of his son and the rejection of his surrogate son, the emperor. And the PDSD Algren showcases for a good chunk of the movie, especially when he's made to detox, is just heart-wrenching. 
And this is a very real thing that people do experience. Mm -hmm. Soldiers do experience. Dealing with PTSD at at that time was before the advent of proper health, mental health care. So how did how did soldiers and traumatized people like that manage it? Booze. Alcohol is a very common one, and sometimes they would turn to faith to help cope. Yeah, like Tatsumoto turned to his faith. And it's beautiful, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like his be- he's also a poet. He turned to poetry to express himself and to uh, you know, like spill his feelings into. And you- there's something very beautiful about it and about his fascination with the Sakura uh blossoms and tree. Mm-hmm. And it's just I I just oh, had so a beautiful. I just had a thought. You why not let's compare the temple uh, Katsumoto was constantly praying in earlier. And the uh when uh, Nathan Algren sh- first shows up. Mm-hmm. He's in that uh there's a lot he's in a cramped location. There's Oh yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of baggage there, and it's dirty, it's pretty much ugly. There's mm. nothing but guns. Yeah. Oh, you mean uh, uh, in his first appearance? Exactly. Oh, yeah. When he first appears, yeah. you're Now, Katsumoto first appears in the first scene of the movie, the prologue, and it's, like, it's in the field. And, yeah, there's... Now, there's also the temple scene that, yeah, that's mm-hmm. good... Like that's the the first time you see Katsumoto in a building. But the first scene you see him in, he's praying in the field and it's very spiritual and beautiful. But the the first scene you see him in a building is in in front of the Buddha where he's doing calligraphy and he's probably writing his poem and he's just praying. Algren's first scene is he's got his uh, booze or rifle in the other hand and he's just barely able to sit down. Mm -hmm. He's just and he's red in the face. And he's red-eyed and just looking haunted. Mm-hmm. And that's really... Yeah, you juxtapose the two. There's just something pathetic about Algren. Mm-hmm. But something majestic and beautiful about Katsumoto, who is based off, obviously, off of Enomoto Takeha- Takeaki, uh, the last historical samurai. Just as Algren is essentially inspired by Jules Lunet, a French officer, artillery officer, who went to Japan to teach the samurai how to use artillery, only to assimilate to their culture and become a samurai. And his swords are on display in France, I think. I Yeah, they are. And that's an interesting location to put them. It's like well, then, well, he took them back home because he was so severely injured, but he wanted to actually die a samurai warrior alongside his uh, sworn brothers, uh, the other bushi. But they would not have it. They wanted him to live. So, and he was too injured to refuse. So they sent, packed him off on a boat back to France, where he was able to recover, and where his swords went with him. And they're eventually, I think, donated to a museum in Paris. But there are some who want to return them to Japan. But I don't think that'd be right because Jules Brunet's swords should lay near where he he died mm-hmm. in France. In France, and just as the swords of the samurai should, all, like of all other samurai, should be returned to Japan. Now, it's the difference is that if a sword is given in a gift to someone, it should stay with them. It's a gift, and to return it to Japan would be to dishonor that gift and the sentiments there. But to steal and plunder the land, like the Allied forces did after World War II, and take swords out of Japan. Those swords have to be returned to Japan because it's the honorable right thing to do mm-hmm. because they were unlawfully taken from the Japanese mm-hmm. who had every right to them. Yes, because it's theirs. It's their heritage. It's one thing to take the military the military's swords. I don't think they should take the swords, those swords, or should have. I think that they should have. It was one thing to take the guns, but not the swords. Mm. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking the military issue. I don't know. Uh, I but no, I, I'm just the, the, the family swords. No, a lot of them were taken. And the thing with now we're getting a little off topic, but this movie is not completely historically accurate. 
Uh, some of the clothes and whatnot is. Uh, the weapons are. Mm-hmm. Now, that said, the actual rebellion in the Boshin War, the samurai did use guns. They did. And they used them to devastating effect. Oh, yeah. But the thing is, in this movie, they're going more for thematic and spiritual. It's a very spiritual movie. Mm-hmm. This is a almost theological movie. And that's a strength. And that's what's so moving and beautiful about it. In a way, Algren kind of uh, finds religion. Now, yes. uh, he obviously converts to Shinto Buddhism, the main, like the main faiths of Japan. Uh, partway through the movie, he does. It's yeah. very obvious. Bob and uh, Katsumoto helped convert. I Bob is uh, is one of my favorite characters. He had a lot of, to say. Yeah, especially that one line, which the actor said like freaking champ. Not to mention, I like the uh, love scene, so to speak, between Koyuki and Cruz, because rather than it being a slapping of bodies out of nowhere, like in most Western movies, it's a simple her pretty much acting like an esquire and dressing him for war. And it's a very spiritual, beautiful scene. That's really how love should be portrayed, more mm-hmm. as a spiritual, and, emotional thing, and you rather than a physical, sexual thing. And you can't help but almost cracking up over that one. It's yeah. Like, it, well, Taka is both the mother and the lover archetype. The mother who mothers her children, but mm. also is the only one capable of forgiving everyone. They're, like, you know what I mean? The warrior, his sins. But the lover who can basically heal him and, well, is, as the name implies, the lover. She's there to love him. But she also is there to teach him to love himself again. And, yeah, like, the movie focuses a lot on brotherly love, so to speak, between various characters. but And also between, like, Taka and Katsumoto and Taka and uh, uh, Nobutada, Mm -hmm. her nephew. But the thing is, it also... the, The romance scenes are very good. Very sensitively written. Uh, this movie almost feels more like it was written by someone who was Japanese. And... I don't know too many of the details, but I would I would hedge my money that there was at least a few Japanese authors involved, like script writers involved, who conveyed their views. Mm-hmm. And now the Japanese are a very sentimental people, and that shows in their films, which I find are typically way better than Western ones. I, honestly, when I'm not like the only reason I watch Western stuff a lot of the time is for this channel. Outside of that, I almost always watch Korean or Japanese dramas and movies because they just as, appeal more to me. As much as I do like my good action movie with explosions and whatnot, some, it, would, it would be nice to see a good, solid movie with knights. With, yeah. with similar to this. It's like, yeah, a Western answer to this in a way. Yeah. Which is spiritual. I'm not talking religious like Kingdom of Heaven was. More spiritual. Mm-hmm. Kingdom of Heaven was a great movie. Oh, it's a freaking epic. But but me, but it was less character focused than this. I'd like to see one that's character focused. Not, mm-hmm. Now, there was character development in that movie. But it was not character focused. Mm-hmm. This movie was very character driven. Yeah, and it talks about what, what makes a samurai. Yeah, what makes... Not to mention, why do people fight? And this is the kind of tone that I'm going to actually attack. Now, one movie that I've had people compare it to, and well, not movie, but like manga. And I just, I'm like always going, no, 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 is Rurouni Kenshin. And the difference is uh, Rurouni Kenshin is garbage. This is basically an opera. Mm-hmm. And I cannot express my hatred for Rurouni Kenshin enough. Now, that said, I like the Samurai X movies. Those are really good. But my problem with the Rurouni Kenshin stuff is that it essentially took the violation of the samurai and played it for laughs and generally said, yeah, whatever. Who cares about our traditions? Epa. Essentially, that's what... The, uh, mm-hmm the writer, the mangaka, was saying about the, his traditions. 
his heritage. And it's just, no, you come from one of the most beautiful cultures on the planet. Honor it. Don't freaking show disrespect to it. Like, but at the same time, Rurouni Kenshin, the other problem is the character, the main character is someone who's a little trashy as a human being. In this, I just mean in this regard. He will not kill, but he'll justify the, the massacres and murders his government does so long as that government's in power. And especially if it's against the, the samurai the, or the uh, children or wives of the samurai. Because you've got people basically being violated and murdered left to right and center by, his gov by the government he supported. And the minute any kind of warrior says, okay, well... We have to, like, we believe that our traditions matter. They're presented as pure evil, and Kenshin's like, ha, scum. Well, no, Kenshin. They just think differently. I just find the character's a, a bit of a fanatic. But that's the difference between him and, say, like, I'm just saying, in how it's presented with Rune Kenshin, like, it's almost a good versus evil. But it wasn't that clear cut. Whereas mm -hmm. every other Japanese drama about this era presents it in a more complex manner. And Last Samurai does no less. It is now, on the one hand, it does provide the it does show the good that the West brought to Japan. Like you have the photography, you've got you no know, like hell, they've got railroads. They've got better commerce. Their economy's never been better. They're finally starting to like get on their feet after the disasters of the past few decades of the shogunate. You know, like there is some good stuff there, and mm -hmm. the people are starting to get happier. But at the same time, there's a craving for tradition and to honor it. And this is really like, pro you know, like moving forward in tradition. Like they're at odds, but we really out to be kind of honoring both in a way. Yeah, and they need to be at odds. Exactly. There seems to be a bit of a cultural shame. Yeah, that's going on in the movie there. And and this can be used as a metaphor even for for uh, the West. It's like, like, there's a cultural shame of our traditions when we have to honor them. Yes. Okay, so people died for uh, to fight against them in shameful ways. But at the same time, it is what it is. We don't need to throw the bathwater, the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And the thing with Katsumoto is, yes, he's a fictional version of a leader who is a more gray figure. Katsumoto's a little idealized. Yes. But he is a great character. And mm -hmm. just looking at him as a as a movie character, a film character, he is a great character. It's... One of the finest ever written. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Ujio, for example, who falls in battle. He's pure warrior. There is not an ounce of doubt in his mind. But even, like, you know, like every character in this movie has little character moments. Even the guys just betting on Algren and Ujio. <laughs> but the thing is, Ujio, for example, in a few scenes, it's just in his eyes, because Hiroyuki Sonata, the greatest Japanese actor who ever lived. Um, yes, I'm a fanboy. Sue me. But uh, Ujio ends up, like, nodding or giving, you know, like, that manly nod, or just with his eyes occasionally showing a bit of respect, growing respect for Algren. And even a few times, towards the end, sometimes starting to almost smirk at him. And Uchio and Algren have a subtle bromance. And that's the thing, like, you look at that, and you can't help but feel fond of it, and even admire it. And, and I can't help but find, this is kind of what's missing from... Uh, we're in attention in a way because you know what I mean? Like having the reverse position because Alan says like, we don't, in the West, we don't kill kneeling enemies and defeat, kneeling defeated enemies. And you have Katsumoto. Well, that's just the way our culture works. And what's funny is Algren assimilates to it. He actually eventually understands that for these people, honor is very important. Now, the difference I'm just opposing it with Rurouni Kenshin is that now, Algren and Katsumoto have PTSD, and there are enemies of Kenshin's who have PTSD. So does Kenshin. But the difference is, Kenshin sees it as, you're not allowed your honor. And you have this enemy. No, it's all I have left. If I don't have it, I have nothing. What, what did I lose my family, everything I have for them? And you have Kenshin. Pretty much spits on them and says, deal. You don't have your honor anymore. 
So when these men say, you know what, I'm just going to choose to die. Kench is like, freaking cowards. Uh, kind of. But they're also kind of trying to make a stand for what they believe in. And they're trying to say, well, we're moving too fast. Maybe some of our traditions out to be honored. And that's something that the character of Kenshin, if you actually watch the more realistic and better Samurai X movies, doesn't understand. But that his mentor, Sejiro Hiko, constantly tries to tell him. And that Kenshin became the weapon of corrupt bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. And that's what Hiko told him. Don't do it. You're going to become, you know, these corrupt bureaucrats uh, lackey. And he did. Even in Rurouni Kenshin, he's a lackey. But in Samurai X, where it's a little different in tone, is that Kenshin realizes he's done wrong. He's like, I can't work for these guys. But then in Rurouni Kenshin, he says, oh, I can. So I'm just saying that's the problem with the writing there. Mm -hmm. I'm comparing. Yeah. Now, the other way is how they show uh, PTSD is that the problem with Kent, Rurouni Kenshin is they play it up for laughs. When it should not be a laughing matter. It pokes fun at PTSD. Mm -hmm. No. This is something a lot of men and women suffer from. Don't freaking say, oh, like trauma. Ain't I right, folks? No, that, that's not funny. Like, stop poking fun at it. Mm -hmm, and there are times where it's taken seriously and other times where it's played a bit for laughs. But the thing is, like, I'm just saying, I'm just comparing. Here, this movie is almost spiritual and paying homage. At the same time, it's paying homage to the warrior archetype, to the traditions of Japan. Mm -hmm. And whatnot. Uh, now, I'm just saying, like, the thing with Rurouni Kenshin is it does not pay much respect to traditional Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. It's no uh, uh, Eiji Yoshikawa novel depiction. Which, it did show the problems of the samurai, but also paid homage to certain great warriors mm -hmm. and showed them respect and dignity. Good. I enjoy Rurouni Kenshin. Do I read or watch it? anymore? No, not so much. But, well, I just find that I've always had a bit of a bone to pick with the manga. Not with Samurai X. Yeah, yeah, I know. Although, that said, this movie is everything it, it tried to be, but couldn't accomplish. Be one, because of the author's mindset. He has very little respect. The manga has very little respect for his own country, I find. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, even though it's directed by Edward Swick, there is, and one of the main stars is Tom Cruise. There is nothing but respect and admiration for Japanese culture. And, well, yeah, there's a lot to admire and love about Jap Japanese culture. Like, And the thing is, Japanese people are inherently such freaking decent, uh, kind, and great people. Like, mm -hmm. uh, they're awesome. So, yeah, like this movie is just, uh, it's gut-wrenching. Mm -hmm. Just in, like, uh, it, it's one of those movies that's so vivid. And it's in my top 50 favorite movies of all times. Yes, and you don't get any better than this. Now let's rate this thing. Rate? Why should we question rating a 4? <laughs> I was going to maybe rate it a 3.3. Yes, How a four. dare you? Yes, a 4. I'll show it the proper due respect and honor. Yeah, this is a 4. Yes. In all seriousness, like, I, I can't imagine rating it any... Like, it, it's a near-perfect film. Mm-hmm. It's just historical inaccuracy. But the thing is, when your story is this, and your writing is this good, mm -hmm. it, and, it and was the meant, acting is this good... It was meant to deviate a bit. Or a lot. But I'd argue that the last samurai in the movie is Ujo. The last uh, <laughs> real lord, or Danyo, is Katsumoto. And Tom Cruise... Although his character is assimilated completely by the end, he is not uh, the last samurai. It's Ujio. Ujio is the last samurai. Because I love uh, his character. And I'm a big fanboy. But man, this movie was perfect. Now, don't forget to like, comment, share the video, and subscribe if you haven't already. And remember to carry forth with you, uh, wherever you go, the warrior spirit.